This day of celebration centers on a story, and this is that story. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? So how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All of them were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Now Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen now to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young shall see visions, and your old shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire, smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. You have uh, perhaps heard the story, I think it's a true story, about a woman who attended worship one Sunday in one of New York City's most prestigious Presbyterian churches. I'll protect the name of the church this morning. The woman visiting worship that day was sitting down in the front, just in front of the pulpit, and during the service, something that was said inspired the woman to stand up and shout, Hallelujah! Just then, an usher rushed down the aisle, tapped the woman on the shoulder, and whispered in her ear, Are you okay? Then he tried to to help her out of the pew and back up the aisle, to which she responded, Sir, I'm fine. I've just got the spirit this morning. The usher replied, Well, ma'am, you certainly didn't get it here. (laughs) My Presbyterian friends, this is the Sunday to liberate your buttoned-up hallelujahs. For today is Pentecost, 
The day when we celebrate the birth of the church, that that astonishing morning nearly 2,000 years ago when, when followers of Jesus and others gathered from all over the world got the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit. They were given the gift of understanding, each speaking their own language and and understanding everyone else. And on that day, a fledgling group of timid and often inept disciples became the church. The church alive, the church on fire. The account of Pentecost in the book of Acts is a vision drawn from the Hebrew prophets and cast for the Christian community. It is a vision of of the church united in common purpose, engaged in common practice, and it is, I believe, God's vision for our church as well. On this day, when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, the birthday of the church, I believe the story of Pentecost offers inspiration for our life and our ministry together. I find that vision best captured by a simple phrase in the first verse of the chapter. Luke, who is the author of Acts as well as his own gospel, writes that the followers of Jesus were all together in one place. Now, perhaps he meant this in a literal sense. They were all in Jerusalem or or all in the same house or the, the same room or the same city square, but I hope you would excuse me for reading a bit more into this language. All together in one place. The disciples sharing fellowship and, and wisdom and, and courage with one another. It was when they were together in one place that the Holy Spirit came. So, too, we must try to be together in one place. Not just in sanctuaries and church buildings, but on the common ground of God's grace. When we are not, the result is not only the fracture of the body of Christ, but also the compromising of our mission in the world. I believe that God's vision for our church is to be a people who willfully transcend all earthly division to live in divine unity. And that's what we have at Pentecost, a picture of a church that refuses to allow human distinctions to outweigh our common identity as children of Almighty God. It is possible and understandable that you tuned out during that painstaking, tongue-tying list of ethnic and cultural groups referenced in this morning's scripture passage. That's okay. Here's what you need to know. Many of the groups Luke includes in his list were enemies of one another at the time of these events, and some still are. The power of Pentecost is that the Spirit of God transcends difference. There were Jews and there were Gentiles, there were Parthians and there were Cretans, There were Arabs and residents of Mesopotamia. There were men and women, young and old, all together in one place. And the power of Pentecost is that the Spirit still calls and people still respond this morning. This very day, we are reminded that that the Spirit of God is still moving still stirring, still guiding and directing, still prying open closed hearts and minds to gospel truth whenever we are together, truly together. What does this togetherness look like? I've been thinking about that word, together, 
As I've listened to the stories commemorating the 75th anniversary of D-Day and the Normandy landings, I've been thinking about those 24,000 from every imaginable background and perspective. I've been thinking about how they were largely strangers to each other. And in the midst of a strange and distant land, more than enough reason for fear. And yet somehow united by a common purpose, bound by a common call, held by a common act of courage. It's extraordinary to me that that kind of unity displayed that day still inspires and moves us three quarters of a century later. And I hope and pray it also calls to us in a time of division and discord, to listen again to the call of the Spirit and the better angels of our own nature, to get ourselves together in one place, united by goodwill for all. You see, these stories, these stories we tell are not confined to the past. The church we celebrate on Pentecost is not an, an ancient, storied, steady, stable, secure institution. It is, it is a church filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and so new every morning like God's mercies themselves. A, a church passionately committed to its mission, so alive, so alive that morning that outside observers thought they must be under some kind of outside influence. A church not filled with wine, but a spirit of renewal. And I know what you're thinking, perhaps. Well, that was the church 2,000 years ago. Well, that was the church 200 years ago. Today, we see a very different picture. You and I, we, we read about it all the time. A, a church mired in conflict, often petty. A tragic parody of its once great self. A, a church gripped by inevitable decline, fading from relevance and influence. A church that if it is not sick unto death has at least fallen asleep on the job. And of course, I read about that church too. But I must say that the description does not depict my experience, nor does it dampen my enthusiasm. When I look across the spiritual landscape of our time, I see a church filled with almost unbelievable potential. And so I must admit that I grow weary of these self-defeatist attitudes, these hopeless cries from church so-called leaders. You see, if the church of Jesus Christ has indeed fallen asleep, then it is a sleeping giant called to rise again and again. This, I believe, is God's vision for our church to choose while we honor our difference to be together in one place. open to the Spirit's presence and aware of the gifts God offers and calls us to use. Maybe like me, you learned this song in Sunday school. And here I will break my self-imposed prohibition on singing from the pulpit with apologies to Dr. Lauer. <laughs> the church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. So differently gifted, yet commonly called spirit-shaped. What a wonder that God has entrusted this mission to you and to me to us together.
As I reflect on why I'm here, that, that togetherness tells the story. I am here because of a beautiful and diverse collection of strange and faithful people. I am here today because Gloria Carell rocked me in the church nursery and kept me in her home. I'm here because Uncle Ralph, he wasn't my uncle, but everyone called him that. He gave me sticks of juicy fruit chewing gum in the church pew. I'm, I'm here because Julia Wetmore taught me children's songs and because Jen Reed Mitchum took me to a Montreat youth conference in seventh grade. I'm, I'm here because a woman named Lena Cooper insisted on giving me a hug every Sunday, even in those awkward middle school years where you don't want anyone near you, and she offered me to be, to be my local grandmother. I'm here because the saints of the church prayed and taught and encouraged me. I'm here because others took their own God-given call seriously to show up in my life. And having been that deeply blessed, I'm determined to pay the gifts of the Spirit forward in my own life and in this community. And this is our call together, Second Church. Each of us given something to do to show who God is and not one of us left on the outside for all of us are essential to this transformative mission. It's God's vision for the church. I, I've seen it dozens of times in my first year here at Second. These acts of kindness that begin with the simple decision to show up, to demonstrate in action the faith you profess with words, it occurred to me that life in the body of Christ is rarely about monumental acts of heroism. Much more is it about the moment of quiet prayer with an anxious friend or an invitation welcoming another to join you. Much more often it's about visiting a friend who is lonely or spending your Monday morning sorting donations or your whole weekend supporting a mission fundraiser. It's about stacking a few extra cans in the grocery cart because we have neighbors who go to sleep hungry at night. It's about offering transportation to those who have none. It's about sharing a homegrown tomato. It's about providing a shoulder for another to cry on, a non-judgmental ear to listen. Listen, it's about a lifetime of these small, insignificant acts that add up in big ways. And so that's what I think it means to get the Spirit. It's what it means to be the church together. great preacher Fred Craddock told a personal story that captures, I think, God's vision for the church. Fred grew up in Oklahoma, and though his mother was a faithful member of a local church and, and took the three children every Sunday, his father, his father would never go to church. In fact, most Sundays he would complain that Sunday dinner was late when the rest of the family came home from church. Every once in a while in that rural community, the preacher would call and want to come by for a visit, and, and Craddock's father's answer was always the same. I know what that church wants from me. The church doesn't care about me. The church wants another name on the rolls, another pledge in the books. Isn't that the name of your game? He'd say to the preacher, one more name, just another pledge. That's what he always said until one time when he didn't say that. He was in the veteran's hospital and was down to 73 pounds. They had put in a feeding tube and x-rays had burned him to pieces. Fred flew in to see him. His father couldn't speak or eat. When he walked into the hospital room, Fred looked around and here's what he saw. Potted plants. Vases of cut flowers on every windowsill and horizontal surface, a stack of cards 20 inches deep by the bedside, 
And even on that tray where they would have put food if he could eat, on that tray there was a flower. And every single flower in the room, every card, every blossom, every potted plant was from someone or some group in the church. Here's how Craddock tells the rest of his story. Dad watched as I picked up a card and read it. He could not speak, and so he took a Kleenex box and wrote on the side of it a line from Shakespeare. If he had not written this line, I would not tell this story. He wrote, In this harsh world, draw your breath in pain to tell my story. And I looked down at my father, and I asked, What's your story, Daddy? And he took that Kleenex box, and he wrote, I was wrong. Amen.